Let's move on to uh, energy now as we skip around just a bit. A mixed day for crude prices with WTI and Brent settling in opposite directions as a weaker GDP print out of China stoked concerns about demand. That move, coupled with ongoing concerns in the Red Sea, have ripple effects on energy equities. The OIH Oil Services ETF, there you go, that's your alphabet soup, uh, dropping a half percent, touching its lowest level in six months. Joining us now to go inside the move, Paul Sankey, president of Sankey Research. When you were here just a minute ago, I barely recognized you. You were all bundled up. You looked like one of those Kansas City fans, not Taylor Swift the other night, but you look like one of the Kansas City fans. Yeah, it's freezing out there, right? So, yeah. So, under... For much of my life, if there was anything that was going wrong in the Red Sea, oil prices shot up. Yeah, that's Stuff a, is going wrong in the Red Sea, and they're not shooting up. Right, and it's a concern for people. And by the way, we have the same thing with, with freezing weather and natural gas prices are not reacting that well. So mm. I think it's been disappointing to oil bulls, if you want, that uh, you know we've seen, as you say, a, a direct attacks on shipping, the rerouting yeah. of shipping. So that alone is going to cause more time for the oil to move around the world and higher costs, obviously. And yet here we are. You know, here we are up. at prices that aren't markedly higher than they were six months ago. Right. And that, but that's another point. I mean, we're still at about $75 Brent. We're still in excess of $70 WTI. So on the other hand, it's not the end of the world. You know, I mean, these are good prices for these oil companies that really start worrying towards 60 Last time, maybe a couple of months ago, I was on here talking about maybe Saudi needs to flush this market, mm. you know, and, and, and in that case, they would be taking it down, I think, below 60. If we're at 75 Brent, you know, you're going to see very good cash returns from the oils this year. Supply is ample, right? Supply is ample, yeah, because of the spec capacity in Saudi Arabia and UAE. So you've got two or three. And again, this is another thing that we would never have seen 20 years ago, that you've got 102 million barrels a day of oil demand. You know, all-time record highs, and yet you still have three or four million barrels a day of spare capacity, and that's simply an overhang on the sector and on the price. Karen? So you just said something about um, making money over 60. Where does it start to be where the equities really get worried prior to 60, I would think? Yeah, what they would do, I think, for example, BP changed CEO or at least confirmed the CEO today. That everything for them is planned at 60, so they're guiding towards $4 billion of buyback at $60 oil. Um, you know, they already pay a 4% yield. So you're getting towards a 9 or 10% yield from BP at 60. Now, they may pay down more debt in the case of BP. They may pay more cash out to shareholders. But essentially, 60 is kind of the working number for the industry. Additionally, if you look at the marginal reinvestment decision for US EMPs and the Permian, they talk about 60. So that's why it may be that we need to get below 60 to really calm down U.S. supply growth, which is essentially part of the problem with oil and a big problem, part of the problem with natural gas. Too much supply from these U.S. companies that are just doing a great job. Steve? So, so I, I get all of that. Just help me through this process, because when I look at Exxon, I look at Chevron, and I look at the M&A, all four of those stocks are below where the announcement was. So I get the whole idea of the acquirer usually trades lower, the acquiree trades higher. All of them are lower. So we've had the times where they were correlated. I'm trying to break the correlation between oil that could fall and the stocks that could run. Right. I just don't see it happening. Why do you think there's been such lackluster performance out of the merger, merger uh, business with the four names that I mentioned? Well, it's a tough one. I mean, I think the first thing is they paid with stock, right? So as soon as you pay with stock, both companies become linked to one another. And as the, as the sector's sold off, then the, the price of the deal simply goes down. And we've seen many deals here at relatively low premiums. Why have the managements not asked for more money? Partly because they can't. Partly, I've got to say it, because they self-enrich. They get change of control. And therefore, you see people selling out that, uh, you know, perhaps are going to get rich themselves. The CEO will get rich without really caring too much about the premium that the companies demand from the Exxons and Chevron. So that's been disappointing. But I think additionally, there's just not that many bids. There's only really Chevron and Exxon that can do these kind of deals. Oxy, we've seen pay a pretty high premium for Crown Rock, which was a, a private in the Permian. But generally speaking, these deals have just not been uh, at great multiples, unfortunately. And that's been another negative for the sector.